knew that there was actually a Michigan beer fight song? Welcome in, every everybody. Welcome into Isabel's Market and Eatery on this Saturday morning. I am thrilled to be here uh, with our esteemed guests, uh, Fred Biltman. I'm gonna Biltman. I'm gonna explain who Fred is and our executive chef, Mike Baraccio. Are we six feet apart? Yep. We good taking off the masks? Okay. We're six feet apart. We're gonna take off the masks. So we wanted to welcome everybody in to this Saturday morning. Um, it's Beer 101 and Books. Well, two good things, right? Absolutely. So the Michigan Beer Fight song I just played, where did that come from? Well, it came from me, but it's been part of the Michigan Brewers Guild for a long time. Uh, I don't know, well over 10 years. And currently it also plays at the top and outro of the Michigan's Great Beer State podcast, which I host and it, produce. Well, thanks for letting us borrow it this morning My for pleasure. this for this uh, Facebook Live from Isabel's Market Neatery. Mike Baraccio, had, did you know that there was a beer fight song? I did not. And this is, see, you learn something yeah, every absolutely. day here. It's sung at every Michigan Brewers Guild beer festival. I mean, people know the words to it. Oh, yeah. That's people cool. People gather around the stage. There's usually about 30 brewers on stage and 100 or so people out front. And so about, you know, like... Three quarters of the way through the beer festival, we have uh, a firkin tapping, and uh, you know people gather around and and uh, exalt our excitement about the Michigan brewing scene. Well, and really, if you're going to do that, you're the guy to have. Fred Bil Fred Biltman, he was on with us the other day. He is a uh, self-proclaimed and actually well-regarded beer evangelist. Is that that's on your business card, isn't it? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and you are a part of the Michigan Beer Guild. Yeah, so uh, I spent uh, a little over two decades at uh, two different Michigan breweries, um, kind of running sales and marketing and, and overall being on the leadership teams of both Bells and then later New Holland, which I recently left. But during that time, I also served as president of the Michigan Brewers Guild. Uh, so it's family to me. And recently, I've kind of shifted careers to more of a uh, consultant and team development and project-based role. Uh, but yeah, Michigan beer, Michigan brewing is family to me. And you know, in full disclosure, you helped us here. You helped us figure out what kegs we needed, what what systems we needed. You helped us a lot at Isabel's well, when we started you. out. So I appreciate that. And Mike Baraccio, our executive chef, who I know likes beer. I do. You like beer a lot. Yep. So this will be a fun conversation. Absolutely. And we're going to talk cookbooks today too. We're going to talk definitely about Fred's cookbook, The Beer Evangelist's Guide to the Galaxy, A Philosophy of Food and Drink by Fred Biltman. And if I'm not mistaken, Mike, you used a recipe today. I did. Uh, there's a beer braised pork belly in there. So we braised some uh, Michigan pork belly in uh, Revolution Oktoberfest yesterday. All right. So, so there you go. So your drunken beer recipe in your book. So we're going to talk. On. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But let's. And then also, um, you are you're an amazing chef, self-taught, but pretty well known around that you you've got an unbelievable skill. As Thank I you. said the other day, the Renaissance man. And Mike, obviously, is an amazing chef. We want to talk some cookbooks today, too, because it's, we're passionate about these. I, I can sit around all day and read cookbooks. I don't know about you guys, but I just love reading different ones. So we wanted to bring in our favorites for anybody on people's uh, holiday lists who you're, you think they're culinary fans, you don't know what to get them. We're going to give you some recommendations for some cookbooks. But let's first start a little bit and talk a little bit about some beer. Um, you said in your book, The Beer Evangelist Guide to the Galaxy, that beer, if I'm, I'm going to quote you here, is the most underrated beverage in the world. <laughs> you believe that? Yeah. You don't well, think I've it's been gotten, working to change it. But, yeah, I was going to uh, say, you don't think it's gotten a lot of love Well, here? it certainly has, and in the last, you know, 10 years especially, uh, it's a lot more top of mind, and it's reached a lot more people. But I do think that, you know, the mid-century, uh, through the 50s, through the 70s, we relegated it to light lager and ball game, and wine was for dinner, uh, spirits was for after dinner, and I think beer kind of got a bad rap. Now, at the same time, it sort of earned it, it uh, meaning that um, mass production and sort of uh, the nationalization of the marketplace reduced hundreds of brewers to less than 50 at one point. And so the... That was a consolidation, So the right? reflection yeah. of there isn't much diversity in beer was true, but it was a very sad state of brewing at the time, and we've since... Uh, eclipsed all previous marks of numbers of breweries, numbers of beers, quality, uh, diversity, all that stuff. So it's a great time for beer now, but its place at the dinner table is still uh, recovering from that era. And you talked in the book about, at the time you wrote this book in 2013, that the craft beer 
world was only 7% of the beer market. That's up to almost 15 now, I think, around the world, right? And definitely in the U.S. And, yeah. and quite frankly, I think we're over-indexing in Michigan. Yeah, I would say all those things are true. And yet that still means that 85% of the beer is not uh, craft brewed by an independent um, smallish creative brewer and is, is made by one of the large uh, consolidated brewers making light lager or owning previously independent breweries. Is that necessarily a bad thing all mm. the time? I think that it's interesting to reflect on because I often talk about size isn't what's bad. It's it's leaving your mission and vision and, and values. And so, but growth shouldn't be the target either. Being great should be the target. So I think as long as people have access to good choices in beer and, um, and the the quality makers are appropriately supported and appropriate is subjective. But I think, I think as long as the independent makers aren't being boxed out of the marketplace by poor business practices, then the number is less relevant. But that number got that low not from just natural attrition. It got that low by some really rough marketplace conditions. So, Mike, you're from the east side of the state, grew up in Rochester, and then lives in, live in Grand Rapids, where I, I told this story the other day. I was flying home from a business trip at one point on one of those little clodhopper planes, you know, from, from O'Hare, and there were maybe 50, 40 seats on the plane, and 39 of the people on the plane were coming to Founders for some every other year or every oh. five-year release. You've seen the beer scene change, I know you have, from, from where you started in, in the east side of the state on over what's your take on where it is now? Has it evolved in, in the evolution? Is it halfway there? Is it so much more to go? What's, what's your take on the, on the beer scene? Um, I love the beer scene in Grand Rapids. Um, I had the fortune of when I was working at Grove, uh, Brewery of Avant was right next door, so we would get beer from them all the time. So that's kind of the, the hometown street kind of thing that I've got going on over there. Um, but Grand Rapids beer scene is great. I love that you can just kind of wander every block and find just a, a little, little beer station. Um, but yeah, compared to the east side when I was growing up, especially kind of in the in the sticks, what Rochester was before, just kind of a big city now, or bigger city, uh, there was like nowhere to go. There's Rochester Mills there for the beer. Otherwise, it's great to have so many different varieties over here. Yeah, and Brewery Vivant is one. Founders obviously is is done. But what I was amazed at, you know, I've 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 lived in Michigan for about six years now, or owned a home here for about six years. When I would first go to Grand Rapids, how the the brewery scene changed Grand Rapids. I mean, it took neighborhoods that weren't vibrant and turned them into vibrant neighborhoods and you still see that evolving even today absolutely all across the state all across the midwest all across the country um one of the great things about it is that it's it's in parallel with the food movement and and really the independent makers movement so right now you know small town usa is reinvigorated by local bakers local coffee uh, roasters or makers um and brewing is no different. We've given a pulse to the downtown Main Street, like you said, being able to walk down the street and have different tastes of different things is awesome. And brewing is one way we've reflected that, and it's a response to that commoditization, to that um, sort of, we, you know, chains are embraced for a couple of decades. And I think this is a response to that of saying, well, wait a second, we, we still want personality in our towns, and we want locals making things Oh, and, and the people's response to that is showing that uh, affinity we have uh, naturally. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about beer. In the book, you have malt-forward styles, hop-centric flavors, um, wood-aged free, uh, styles, right, wood-aged free styles, and cellar-forward styles. Are those yeah. the four, if you're looking at beer, are those the four main categories of beer? Well, not by the textbook, unless this is your textbook. But uh, <laughs> This meaning I Beer Evangelist Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, by the way, I mean, if you have questions for Fred, please Facebook Live them. We're going to take them live on the air. So here. that is the way I help break things down, and uh, depending on which direction you come at it, what I wanted to do uh, is... Uh, lead readers and tasters into a way of looking at it in terms of families of flavor instead of the DNA of how it's made. That if you're teaching somebody how to taste, it's different than teaching them how to cook or teaching them how to brew. And what I found was at the time, especially when I came up in the uh, early 90s, we were talking beer to guests as if we were giving a brewing lesson. And it would go over their head and they didn't have a shelf, they didn't have a way to organize that information about well, you need to know if it's an ale or a lager. You need to know if it's top fermented or bottom fermented. You need to know bitterness units. And a drinker just getting introduced to it is just, it's all Greek. So, right. And it's, I mean, it's interesting. It's as confusing, 
I think, is the wine space at times. I mean, it, it can well, There's be. more ingredients, and there's a wider flavor wheel. And so, um, but, and even though, so I also talk about how it's not fair to describe a beer as hoppy or malty to a beginner. And if we uh, kind of use the, what I use with horses too, the whiteboard, and try to erase that idea of our preconceived notion of this drinker coming to me, if I try to uh, not recognize expertise or lack of expertise and instead describe things as if they know nothing, I'm going to be a lot cleaner with my words and I'm going to be a lot more understandable. And so even though those categories include hop and malt, they're a path into saying we need to know what malty tastes like and we need to be able to talk about sweetness, roastiness, caramel, toast. What's the difference between toast and roast and nuttiness? And uh, if we know we like those flavors, then someone with some background can say, oh, you're going to do well with malt-forward flavors. I find them in these various styles. That includes ales, lagers, big beers, little beers. And same thing with hops. If you start to understand that we're talking about grapefruit and citrus and herbaceousness and bitterness and aromatics. So if somebody likes those things, then I can head to this other family of beers that, again, includes ales and lagers, big beers, little beers. But we can start to start with the drinker and the food, especially when it comes in the kitchen, if you're cooking, you're thinking, what would I like with this dish, either as an accompaniment or as an ingredient? And a cook starts with flavor and then finds the ingredient that serves that purpose, unless, of course, they're cooking that ingredient as the beginning of the dish. But that flavor first mentality to me helped opened up how I taught beer to people. It threw away some of the technical stuff or at least set it aside. If somebody wants to brew, that's another lesson. First, we need to get people to understand the invitation to taste and how to uh, combine things together. Well, and I'm going to ask both of you your your you know some beers on your desert island. You get three beers. What are they going to be, right? So you get to pick those here in a little bit. I'm I'm giving you a heads up that I'm going to ask that. <laughs> Welcome in everybody. To Isabel's it's Market Needery in Douglas, Michigan. It is tough. It is tough. We're talking beers and cookbooks this morning. We're going to give some ideas of our favorite cookbooks when we get done talking with Fred Biltman, our beer evangelist about beer. You made a comment about beer flavors, and I just have to ask this in the book. By the way, the book is really well written. Thank it you. is an easy read. It's great. We do have some here, and I know you've signed a bunch for us. We do have some here at Isabel's Market Neater if you have beer lovers on your uh, holiday list. The Beer Evangelist Guide to the Galaxy, and then we also have The Rising Tide. But in The Beer Evangelist, what I love about it is it's very personal. It's very funny. It's, it's, it's really, really well written and easy, easy read. But you mentioned in there that <clears throat> I'm just going to take it directly from the book. You ready? Sex and combining uh. beer flavors have a lot in common. <laughs> 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 it's a little bit of a laugh. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you mind explaining explaining that? I think everybody yeah, watching at home is quote that probably do better than I do. Right no, now. That, that's what you said. I <laughs> well, think, you know, I think it was something like the fact that it you can't really explain it, but you just know it when it's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. You and you want more of it. And yeah. uh, it's one of those things that when you get out of the mechanical, when you get, you, getting past the mechanics of it, and, and when it becomes passionate, when it becomes about um, beauty and gracefulness and, and this connection, then it's magical. And you know it when you feel it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned the other day when you were on the air, one way that we as as consumers at home could experience beer that's a little more like people experience wine, which I thought was a really cool idea right. when we were talking about the tables. So talk a little bit about what we can do if, if we're novices in the beer space, and then we're going to ask you some real specific questions about certain kinds of beers. But And if you have any questions, by the way, please Facebook Live us. We're right here. Fred will take them. I'm certain he'll give a good answer. <laughs> talk a little bit about using a tasting concept of beer versus what we normally do, which is open up a bottle or a can or a growler and pour ourselves a full glass. Yeah, I think it's uh, sort of just about opening doors and, and uh, smaller glasses in a way, smaller sips, and, and allowing yourself the opportunity to try things um, and sample. And I, I think in addition to that sort of, you know, pragmatic version, um, I also encourage people to not ask their first question when you taste anything shouldn't be do I like it or not. I really encourage people to just try to identify what do you taste. And so if your brain is going through the exercise of, hmm, I recognize that, but what is it like? Oh, that seems, uh, you know, like that tastes like pecans or that tastes like uh, chocolate. Um, that exercise sets aside this warning sign, this good or bad, good or evil uh, assessment. And this goes for anything, food included. But for beer, I think a lot of times it's like, am I going to like this? 
and, and you're coming into it with this pass fail. Right, right. And if we move our palate to more of an assessment, then the door opens wider. And we say, well, that's interesting. I haven't had something like that before. That's interesting, and I like it. And beer, one of the beautiful things about beer, not only with its flavors of fermentation, and like you can create references to hundreds and thousands of flavors without those ingredients, meaning malted barley can present chocolate and caramel, and fermentation can create clove and banana. And so you don't have to have those ingredients, but you have sort of a million points of light. So we can be, enter our palates can be entertained by that, and we may not think we like beer, but there are beers that are going to come in a different window and bring flavors that might be in our wheelhouse. So there's more than people expect, typically. That's corollary with food. I mean, yeah. right? When you taste something, it's the same concept. I, it, I'm not going to... You, you were talking about what were, turnips earlier, and I'm yeah. like, I don't like turnips. And Mike's like, no, 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 you haven't had the right kind of... Right, you, you probably had just had a grocery store turnip versus just, you know, the expression of a turnip that could be uh, something from a farm stand or something like that. But like beer, I think that people just get used to that. This tastes like a can of bread. And then that's what beer is to them. Instead of being like, okay, well, it's not just a, a simple lager. You can try so many different things. Have a taste of being like, this is like the best iced tea that I've ever had or something like that. And just have a lot of different, like you said, flavor expressions that they kind of start to relate to. So and you cook, food. you cook with beer quite a bit, right? Yeah. Um, so like how I've kind of approached the uh, that Revolution Oktoberfest yesterday was my familiarity that, you know, some of those lighter beers have orange flavor to them and coriander, some ginger things, some different like warm spices. So I added just to kind of mirror that uh, ginger, clove, um, some orange peels in with the braise so you can kind of pop that beer flavor instead of just having it kind of be muted once you reduce it. So just kind of taking the flavors from beer, if it's not necessarily in the beer, adding those like raw ingredients to it and just kind of popping off of that. All right, so Fred, beers. So we're going to talk about drinking winter, right? So in your book, you talk a little bit about, and I, again, I want to show everybody the book. It really is a great book. Uh, it's such it's such a great, and I'm not just saying that because you're you. sitting here and we're selling them. It's a really great book for anybody who's a beer lover or loves to cook. Um, and and a, you're a great storyteller, and I think that's what people will see. But in the book, you talk a little bit about drinking summer, drinking spring, drinking fall, and drinking winter. So it's winter now, or going to be this week here in Michigan. So what should we be drinking beer-wise? Well, what, what, what are the hot things to be drinking this winter? Well, I love heading into the bigger flavors, um, you know, dark, bold stouts, uh, really across the range of alcohol, meaning it can be an oatmeal stout at 5.5%, it can be an imperial stout at 11 just that kind of bold... Uh, big roastiness, and I like barley wines and wheat wines. Um, I would say for me, I, I tend a little bit more on the malt spectrum anyways, but in the winter, I, I love those uh, big malt-forward beers. Like what? What would, we, what would we look for? Oh, like, well, one is that, well, you talked about the, uh, the Death Star by Revolution the other day, Dragon's Milk, an example of this is its heyday for me. It's a year-round beer. Um, you know, any of that stuff. Uh, I have, um, I'm drawn, my, my library sometimes has a lot of New Holland beers from my uh, well, that's career, all right. we, but we like love Pilgrim's Dole is my, is a, is a definitely a desert island beer for me. That's a, uh, a big, bold, uh, almost 12% wheat wine. And that is comparable to barley wines and old ales. Um, and they drink beautifully in the winter and they're wonderful with food. Pilgrim's, I mean, Pilgrim's Dole? Pilgrim's Dole. Pilgrim's Dole, New yep. Holland. Yep. That'd be a good winter beer. Absolutely. Dragon's. Dragon's Milk. Yep. And then yep. our Revolution Death Star. Yeah. Right? Which uh, we talked about the other day. So there's a few of them. Oh, we've got a question coming. Okay, Mike. So Desert Island, what's your beer? Um, let's see. I spent a lot of summer on the beach in Sagatuck this year, and I liked uh, drinking Stillwater's uh, Sake-style lager. Um, so just like really crisp, clean um, super low alcohol and that just kind of like a crushable one so that's i think i'm sitting on a beach on a desert island that's probably what i'd be drinking you know we also and I, I i should mention this we've got another great brewery right here a couple of them but saga tuck brewing company's got some great beers absolutely and they're right here you know right down the street from us actually we could probably look out the window and see them from yep. here where we are all right we've got a question uh facebook question from a miller light drinker trying to acquire a taste for craft beers suggestions for newbies well, on this brings up a great point i was going to make a little bit ago and it goes back to that flavor first question is you were talking about what people come to expect and the canned uh, bread <laughs> analogy. And I, I was going to say in this country, one of the, you know, 
sort of soapbox sad moments is that we're introduced to drinking and beer like unsupervised unmentored you know depending on your age for me high school you know bad beer experience and so there's a lot of people who's who we don't have a reference point for hops we don't have a reference points for the flavors in in beer in general especially not light beer and so sometimes we have a rough introduction because uh, it's just partying right, and right. um so there are people who left that and later as their palates developed they started drinking wine and other things um and i don't think palates are very gender specific but our experiences often are so a lot there's a lot of women who drink wine and have a bad association with beer and i think some of it's how it started anyways going back to miller light drinker uh, some people and sometimes depending on the conversation with that drinker the the right thing to do is find a beer that's in that neighborhood a Kolsch, a Hellas, a light lager, low hopped, uh, round, soft, semi-sweet, malt forward lager or blonde ale. And that's how I would describe it to a bartender. I wouldn't try to... So like a blonde, like the Sagatek Brewing Blonde. Exactly. Like one of those. Right? That's going to be a neighbor to a light beer. Okay. And so it's going to be a little bit more full bodied. It's going to be a little bit more presence of flavor, but it's gold. It's easy going. It's similar. Now for somebody who doesn't like light beers... But as a beginner coming in, why would we, and a lot of times that's what they, oh, you're a beginner. I got to go easy on you. I got to go to the beginner's route. And that's not true. They're not a beginning eater and drinker. Right. And they're there's just, not a beginning beer or, a, I mean. Their it, palate is not a beginner. It's, right. it's decided whether they like things every day of their life. So when we go beginner expert, we totally skip the fact that we're all expert tasters. Right. And so it's, what do you like? Do you like coffee? You know, do you like uh, red wine? Do you like uh, chocolate? Do you like grapefruit? Those questions will say, okay, I don't think a light beer is for you. I don't think a golden lager is for you. I think you might like an oatmeal stout. I think you might like a barrel-aged stout. Surprisingly enough, barrel-aged beers are uh, very resonant with wine drinkers. They look like advanced beers. They're higher in alcohol. They have tannin structure. They have bold flavors going into the barrel, coming out of the barrel. And so we don't oftentimes the hesitance is that we can't give that to a beginner beer drinker you can if they like big bold red wines so what's a barrel whiskey. aged what's an example of a barrel because i i'm a i'm an italian red wine drinker that's my if i go to red wine i go to an italian red i like the big bold so what what's the barrel aged well beer some of the beers we mentioned dragon's milk death's tar uh kentucky breakfast stout uh so many breweries have barrel aged beers around here it's remarkable but uh they're taking a fermented beer they're aging it in typically a whiskey barrel um, and then it's coming out of that barrel with additional toasted notes from the charred oak and notes of vanilla maybe some resonant flavors from whiskey and and a marriage of flavors with those bigger bolder malt flavors and so they're they're reminiscent of you know the, of well depending on what the base flavor was there's blonde versions too but a lot of them are known to be big big beers and they're they're resembling like a sherry or uh lightly uh, or lighter whiskeys it's really funny i would never have thought to make an analogy between being a wine drinker and the kind of wine and beer i mean it, they're like different planets right you know they're completely different planets in the universe to me but they shouldn't be because it's all about the flavor profile and that's basically Agreed. what you're telling us so try beers that we wouldn't normally try try little sips buy a few here or there buy a few crafts and instead of saying, oh, I like that or I don't, your advice is, what do I taste? That's what we should be asking ourselves. Yeah, and the same thing that I would hope for, that, uh, that I hope for as a eater and drinker and a server. I really want to encourage and drinkers and themselves, being their own servers, that if I were at a restaurant, and we can imagine pre-pandemic days when we had the luxury. <laughs> Remember what that was like, no, Mike? I don't forget. Um, <laughs> but if somebody said, what would you like to drink today? And I said, well, and I wanted to engage in a conversation about that. I'm a lot more comfortable with somebody who knows beer, wine, spirits, coffee, everything. Somebody who can take me on a tour of their whole beverage menu and say, you know what's great with this? And stretch me into something new. Versus somebody who says, well, I only know beer. So if you want to know about wine, i got to get somebody else. And I think we, I would think that would be sort of an unbalanced server if they only knew one beverage and then totally shut the door on the others. But we do that to ourselves. But people at home are saying, I am a wine drinker. I don't drink the other thing. Right. And we serve ourselves beverages more than the professionals do. So I, it's just an encouragement to advance oneself, not for being, uh, I don't know, pretentious or anything, so that you can explore uh, fun things. And so 
I see them very much as the same world and just different expressions of different ingredients. All right. Uh, Desert Island beer? Well, I mentioned one of them's Pilgrim's Dole. Um, and Dragon's Milk is, is my original Desert Island beer. They're both New Holland beers. I, I, both spent, I spent a lot of time with them in my career. And I brought Dragon's Milk to lots of people. So I have a very emotional relationship with that beer. I think it's a great interloper between beer and wine and beer and food. And you said three earlier before we were All on right, camera. Yep. I don't have my third yet. It's right. tougher. Michael? Well, I gave one. Uh, the second one probably be a, a sour from Crooked Stave in Denver. Just a nice kind of tangy something. Like that's, nice. I, I got kind of, you know, stagnant on beer for a while. And then I started drinking sours, you know, five, six years ago. And I was like, oh, well, this is cool because it's like flavors I've never had before. It's uh, really tangy, acidic. And when you I don't cook a lot, sometimes you have flavor fatigue and wine and beer can kind of just kind of become one note. And when you drink really acidic, sour things, it just kind of brightens everything up. And it's really fun to cook and eat food with that. I, I, would, I like the blondes. Here, here. I like the blondes <laughs> from Saga Tuck Brew. I love Stiegel. Grapefruit, I, oh, I, nice. I I I know, and that's I more my, <laughs> that's my summer drink. That's my I'm out on the water. I'm up, you know, at, at Oval Beach. That's what I'm going to drink. Um, and I really love the Euchre beer from oh, yeah. y- that's from Ipsy, right? Yeah. So now, as a wine drinker, you just yeah. expressed two beers that have grapefruit uh, in their profile. I know. Yeah. So you are you are primed to enjoy beers and beers that might be more adventurous for some others because you're. You're going to like pale ales and IPAs, and you're even going to like some of the more, the newer styles like New England hazy IPAs. Um, although grapefruit is more in kind of the traditional IPA. So I, you are, you have a palate that would like beer if you were taken on a wider tour. Well, I think we should do this. You know what I was thinking? You know, with wines, have you guys seen the wine kits that you get and they send it to you and they say, do you like chocolate? There's like an algorithm, right? There's some kind of artificial intelligence algorithm that says, well, then you'd like this kind of wine. Is there that such a thing for beer? And if not, can we just create that next week? You and me and Mike, we could put that together. Sure. We, and we can certainly, I think, uh, a little less ambitious for <laughs> next week. <laughs> That's not, would not be, I ambitious. think we could do beer 201. And we'll take you through a style tasting, uh, through the four families of flavor. Okay. Uh, maybe with some tastings. Maybe it's not next week. But either way, we take you, a wine drinker, uh, on a safari, on a beer safari. I, a beer safari? I love it. We yeah. can do this on Facebook Live. And then if, but if Absolutely. I, all right, we can do that. All right, one last question about beer, and then we're going to talk about cookbooks. Because we're going to give some hints of our favorite cookbooks mm-hmm. for people, um, for any culinary people on their shopping list. What beer hasn't been created yet? If you could wave your magic beer wand, oh, Obi Wan, yeah, Obi Wan Fred, and you could create a beer, what's not out there that the world needs? We're answering that right now. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing like. <laughs> uh, you didn't come prepared for this. <laughs> Well, this is a live show, man. There's no pre, you know. Well, I wasn't sure if that was a question to ponder while we talk cookbooks. Anyways, well, we can, I would you say that, do that? that. Why don't we? Why don't we ponder that? We'll okay. talk some cookbooks and we'll come back. That's good. What hasn't been created in the beer universe? That's and good. if anybody out there has ideas, we're, we'll, I'll we'll let take that them. idea ferment in the um, <laughs> Wait, brain cell. Where's my? Where's my sound? I think I have a. Oh no, that's not right. No, that's not right. No, there it is. But I'm bump. Did you get that? Got a little. Uh, you got a little drum thing. Sweet. Yeah, drum roll. All right, goal. let's talk cookbooks. So, again, we've got your cookbook here, which is, it, so this Beer Evangelist Guide is not only a story, but it's a great cookbook. There's some really great, the drunken pork belly we're going to have on sale here later, yep. I think, right? You yep. made that yesterday. I went in and tried it. It was pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've got some other really, the, uh, the Dutch eggs, the Scotch eggs. Yeah. With beer, that's a fun one. In the, in the cookbook. So from a cookbook and perspective. And it's Scotch deviled eggs. So Ooh. it's a twist. And I think this may lead me to my later answer on what's out there in beer. I mean, I think the, the beautiful thing about beer, brewing, food, you find I tie everything together usually. But it's like a lot of it is revi- revisions and twists and bringing personality into something that exists. I mean, the structure of beer is there. Beer is great as it is, but I think personality and, and creativity is always going to find a way to express something new. Similar, Scotch egg is an old recipe. Yeah, for I've sure. I've never seen it deviled and smoked. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to bring some of what I'm doing in at, versus saying, here's the traditional Scotch egg. Um, and it's an idea to kind of bring light to something. 
Yeah, well, it was a cool recipe. So, Beer Evangelist Guide to the Galaxy. You've signed a few of these. I, I, I've heard, I've had a couple people come and say, would he sign them directly for me? I said, I, I think he probably would. So, they're here. All right, let's talk about our other favorite cookbooks. Um, and we brought some in. Now, these are just hints. Um, we don't have these here, but I can tell you, you could go talk to Cheryl at the Book Nook in Saugatuck. She could probably order these in for you. She's awesome. So, um, obviously Amazon, but we'd like to support, especially on Small Business Saturday, we'd love for you to be able to support local businesses here locally if you are. So call Cheryl at the Book Nook. You cannot talk cookbooks in this county or in this town without this one, which let me zoom it in, which is the Silver Palette Cookbook. So for those of you who don't know, this cookbook has sold almost, I think, 3 million copies and it's, That's it a few out. more than Beer Evangelist got. <laughs> a few, just a couple more zeros, bud. Uh, in, I think it came out in 1982. And uh, Sheila Lukens and Julie Rosso. Julie Rosso owns the Wickwood Inn in Saugatuck, and she lives here. And I have to tell this quick little story. When um, the night before we opened Isabel's, I was outside uh, spraying, power washing the sidewalk. And this car pulls up, and the window rolls down. And she says, boy, you'll do about anything, won't you? And I looked, and it was Julie Rosso. And, and I said, Julie. And I said, do you want to come in? And she said, I sure do. So we brought her in the night before. And there were a group of, uh, you were here, Mike. You got to meet her. And, and Sue Chayton, our culinary director, who, although she's lived here a while, never met her. Julie Rosso walked in this building, and it was like royalty came in. She is, this cookbook, if you don't have this cookbook, or if you have young cooks and you want people who want to learn how to cook, this cookbook, according to Sue Chayton, if you follow the directions and you follow the, these recipes, you will never screw up one of these recipes. It is so well thought through and so well done. So I have to say this would be my number one cookbook to recommend, The Silver Palette. Again, talk to uh, Cheryl down at the Book Nook in Saugatuck, and you can get this. And, and probably, maybe if you hang around Wickwood long enough, maybe Julie will sign it. But she's so humble. She's so shy. Remember, we were talking yeah. to her about coming in and doing a podcast. Oh, I don't know. I... I <laughs> She's, she's amazing, and this cookbook is, is an amazing cookbook. Yeah, awesome. All right, what do you got? Well, th this might not be my current recommendation for young cooks, but it was a formative book for me as a young cook. So I tell the story in the book, and my short version for today is that I uh, grew up kind of a latchkey kid. I knew how to make an omelet and a sandwich, and, uh, but I came from a big family, and I didn't quite know how much – how how deeply my uh, how my instinct to host was until I went to college, got in my first apartment, and I was like, I have a place of my own. I'm going to invite people over. And I invited uh, two young women that I'd met for dinner, and that day I realized I didn't know how to cook. <laughs> and so I called mom, who like walked me through some... I'm sure it's regret. I've blocked the memory, but a regrettable version of broiled chicken or something. So whatever, it was all nice. I still had an apartment. But that Christmas, I got this very book. This is a book I got from my mom. Uh, and the next year, I basically cooked through it cover to cover. So this was my seed of inspiration of learning techniques, calling home just about every time I got a word like fold that I didn't understand. Right. Um, so this was a start for me. I found some other books that I'd recommend now as the basis, but... Uh, this is it for me, personal. All right, Mike, to you. Now, mm. We asked you to bring in your favorite cookbooks yeah. to recommend. So to I usually have like 10 in my car. Yeah, Mike, um. Mike and I, will. We, we go back and forth. I'll get a cookbook and I'll say, oh, my God, it's the greatest. He goes, yeah, I've got that. Or he'll come <laughs> in and say, oh, I got this. Yeah, I got that. I, it's an issue. I it buy is. a lot of cookbooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first one is charcuterie. Uh, so these are um, Brian Polson's from the east side. Uh, I think I got this when I was like 18. I was living in Chicago. And that um, up, Mike. There we go. yeah, there we go. so it's uh, talks um, about sausage making and different like cured meats. You can make your own bacon. And when I got this, when I was uh, you know, ten years younger now, uh, it was a huge inspiration about learning how to like butcher meat and take things apart and how to emulsify sausage and things like that. And then it got me excited and interested in um, kind of some of the regional cooking from where my grandparents are from in Italy. Um, so this was just a huge inspiration, uh, you know, sausage making and kind of curing and smoking meat can be intimidating, but these are like really specked out recipes. Brian Polson teaches, um, at Schoolcraft on the East side. So they're like really user friendly, um, some troubleshooting, good notes and a lot of like good stories about how these things came about. So that's one of my favorites. All right. And you were 18 when you got that. 
I mean, or 17. 17 yeah. or 18. And so that did that kind of kick you into really realizing you wanted to do this forever? Yeah. I had a similar thing where, you know, I grew up in a restaurant, so people just assumed I could cook. And I had this, you know, osmosis of learning by growing up with my grandparents. But when I moved to Chicago as a kid, uh, I got people just expect me to be able to cook. And I had to just kind of, you know, troubleshoot my way through some things, just kind of, you know, pull stuff out of nowhere. And then I kind of was like, all right, well, now I need cookbooks. And then I started working in restaurants and stuff in the city. And so, yeah. Someone tried to call me out, and I had to actually be able to put up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That happens. All right. Next cookbook. This one actually has another local connection. This was dropped off to me by some friends from uh, from our church. Uh, Nan and Austin Belchner stopped by last week to bring me this book, Wild Mushrooms, and it's a cookbook and foraging guide by Kristen and Trent Blizzard, and Kristen is their daughter. So uh, Nan and Austin's daughter and her son-in-law created this book. They live in Colorado full-time, but they go in the summers to Oregon, and they camp, and they forage, and if you like, if you're one of those people that's going out trying to find morels, you want to go out and do mushroom hunting, this book is fantastic. It's hints on how to find them, what to look for, how to, how to make sure that you cut them, you never pull them, how you clean them, how you store them, and then it's an entire cookbook of recipes. Um, my favorite was this, uh, where is it? It's a wild mushroom jambalaya, which nice. sounds unbelievable. So it's a beautiful book, really well done. And again, um, Cheryl can probably order this for you at the Book Nook of Saga Talk, or you can get on Amazon. It was number 14 in the cookbooks on Amazon last week. So congratulations to Kristen. Yet, and I, want one. I know, I saw yeah. you eyeing it. That looks it. great. It, it is, it really is. And it's, it, it's, it's really easy to read, and I learned a ton about mushrooms. And there's a wild lion's mane mushroom recipe in here, and mm -hmm. we have the gourmet lion's mane out here uh, from Jim kinds, Case yeah. at Pebble Creek. Yeah, but this is how you go out and find them and, and it, all of that. It brings up a thought I was uh, thinking about while Mike was talking, too, that technique is often a, a big barrier for people. If you don't know how to do something, it looks like another world away. Like making sausage is a great example. Or like, I like sausage, but uh, that seems way out there. And books and mentors and people teaching, same thing with foraging mushrooms requires some knowledge to make sure that you do it right and safely. Have uh, you ever done it? Uh, yeah. I, my favorite way to forage for mushrooms is to find people who have found mushrooms. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I cook them. So you forage lack, for their phone numbers? I lack the is patience. that what you do? I no, but or like, your chef people call you and they're like, I have all yeah. these foraged mushrooms. You're like, I'll, like, I'll take Have them. you ever done it? Have you ever gone out and tried to do it? Um, the, over the summer, I definitely called Jim Case, our mushroom guy, and was like, I sent him a screenshot and was, or a picture of a mushroom. I was like, can I eat this? And he'd be like, you're going to run me out of business. That's what he sent me a So you times. did. You've actually foraged yeah. and gone yeah. out and done it. Yeah. I, I know. I mean, the people and that do it, it's it's yeah. it's almost like a, I hate to say the word cult, but it's like once they start and they get into it, they can't stop. Well, and your right. neighbors, a southerner, have done a morel dinner for years, and that used to include a foraging dinner where a bunch of us would go out and learn from a forager. And then you kind of see you see the personality types of like, Oh, those are real foragers. You're a mushroom guy. Even if they're doing it for the first time. Yeah. And then I'm sort of like, you know, distracted instantly. But like in our house, my wife Ula loves to find morels. I love to cook them. Works out well. And it, you said our neighbors, but actually your neighbor, Matt Millar, yeah, from the Southerner. And in, in your book here, he does a wine, a, a beer dinner. And there's a recipe and a whole yeah. menu for yeah. a beer dinner. He so also authored the uh, foreword. He did. Matt Millar, and again, another amazing... Uh, another amazing chef. Okay, well, this is an interesting one. Could you make a, this is a Facebook question. Again, put them in Facebook Live. We'll answer them. Could you make a mushroom beer? Uh, definitely, if you were in uh, Washington State, I believe, who legalized, oh, we're talking about not culinary that, not mushrooms. That kind, not that kind of mushroom beer. No, uh, no. Yeah. Green Koi is listening right now, I'm sure. But uh, That's a good question. I certainly think you could. There's a lot of beautiful flavors. I think you, uh, to me, the question, I haven't, I can't think of one. What I would be thinking about from a production adjacent mind is how to stabilize that flavor. So extracting the essence of mushrooms, but having something that's going to uh, stay well in the finished product and not stale uh, or otherwise create off flavors. Because I think that's such a dynamic flavor, you'd really want to be careful that you didn't have something that was going to degrade over time. So I would be finding a way to extract the essence of mushrooms in a uh, steep or something I mean, like it's that. almost like sometimes you see beers and you think, what were they thinking? Trying, like that one could go either really, really great or could break bad pretty quickly, I would think. It could. And I, I think also that's just a beer that I would, I don't know, that's my first gut instinct is I'd, I'd want to I'd want to watch that on the shelf before I started yeah. letting it go out yeah. to too many people. All right, cookbook. What do you got? All right, cookbook. My next one here is another early one for me, and it's uh, Julia and Jacques cooking at home. 
the paper cover is gone. There's a lot of food stains in it. Um, and so uh, Julia Child has several of my top 10 cookbooks and Jacques Pepin. So here they will put a traditional recipe in the center and then on the sidebar each of them talk about how they make it at home and their variation and how they think about how the other one prepares it and that as a home cook I mean you mentioned uh, the word chef earlier and I, I used to have even though I've worked with hundreds of chefs selling beer to restaurants I had a little intimidation at the beginning of like do I call them chef do I is it chef last name chef for, who's the chef are they all chefs <laughs> and then they walk through and go hey chef and to each other and it was very confusing and a little intimidating and I kind of digress into that because this to me really connects with the cook in me. And when I'm, I consider myself a cook and I consider a chef, someone who's running a kitchen, uh, which can be at home and you can nod to it. And I don't, I just think that's the distinction. And at home, uh, I'm a cook and this is Jacques and Julia living as cooks and sharing their insights about how they cook at home. That's and a that's a great one. We'll have to check that one out. Um, Mike, you always get, whenever I call you chef, you look at me and roll your eyes. Yeah. Yeah, I had a bad experience as a, as a young person where everyone in the kitchen uh, was just called each other chef, so I didn't know anyone's names when I was there. <laughs> and uh, I don't that's know. It's confusing. It's, it's way more just like we all work together. We spend like 60 hours a week together, so I'd rather just call each other by our names. <laughs> all right, so what's your what's your next one? So this is a newer one. I think I got this like a year and a half ago. So Pasta Grannies, um, they have a awesome. Pasta Grannies? They have such a good YouTube channel. Did your mom, did your grandmother do this? No, I bought this for her actually. Um, so they have a, it started as a YouTube channel. Um, they wanted to kind of preserve uh, some of the old um, known as recipes in Italy. So they just would go to all these different, they still do it, all these different households in um, Italy. And these like 90 year old women teach people how to make pasta. And then there are all these regional areas. It is fantastic. So um, there's some great, just like really homey recipes. Everything's meant to be made in a home kitchen. It's and fantastic. they have a YouTube channel? They do, Pasta Grannies. Hold that one back up again, yeah. Pasta Grannies. Highly recommend. Hold that one down just a little bit. There Hold, we go. There you, you go. got it. Pasta Grannies. Again, check with uh, Cheryl at the Book Nook and Saga Talk before you go to Amazon. It's Small Business Saturday, so we want to support all of those. You know, I have a, a kind of a funny story. I've told you this story, but I was taught in Bologna at the Bologna Cooking School, which I thought was going to be in a room like this, right, where we have a cooking school, and it was actually at Big Carlo's apartment. Um, with his 90-year-old sister who didn't speak English, and she taught us the pasta song. And they had a, someone there translating. And Is it a fight song? Well, not quite yeah. as good as the beer, Michigan beer fight song we started the show with, but it was basically every morning, everybody in those families would wake up, and this was the fork uh, mixing the egg and, and the, the flour, flour, and that was it, and that's their pasta song. So I, I I'm going to get that book. I don't it's have great. that one. All right, um, I'm going to bring one up now that you and I both love. Mm -hmm. This is called uh, Six Seasons. Hang on, let me get my right. Uh, Six Seasons, A New Way with Vegetables, Joshua McFadden. This, if you have vegetarians in your life, or I'm not a vegetarian and I love this cookbook. This is an amazing cookbook. He basically is a farmer and it talks a lot about, un he understands vegetables and how to bring them to life. He does spring, he talks about the different seasons. Mike, right. you love this one too. I do. Um, you know, Michigan, people usually think that we're just like corn. But we have really great produce, especially in the summertime. And you can, uh, you know, not just eat boiled broccoli and stuff. So this book really shows you how to make cool things with celery, with um, all sorts of different vegetables that you wouldn't. Fava really beans eat. and yeah. asparagus. It, it really brings different vegetable vegetables together and and legumes together in a way I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And, and it really, it's an amazing book. It's a beautiful book. So yeah, if you have someone, have you have you do you have this one? No, I don't. But I almost brought a vegetarian cookbook, and I love meat, but I was just going to add to it, like, I think, and the one I was going to bring is um, Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone, and we've nicknamed it When Crunchy Comes to Dinner, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then it got nicknamed shorter to just Crunchy, like, I don't know, like, what are we going to make? I don't know, check Crunchy. And um, the reason I'm joking about it, or bring that joke up, is that I think, um, especially if you're cooking for vegetarians, cookbooks are a great idea because they not only help you, like, it's not just the how, it's how to transform vegetarians into entrees and dishes because I, I always, as a host, I want to uh, treat my guests as much as possible and make things feel easy and, and feel wonderful. And so I don't want to serve vegetarian uh, sides. Right. Imposed you, on a plate. I want to. And so for me, I may need a little. That's where I need a little nudge from an expert who's got 
a, it's all technique a different based. experience yeah. than me. And so I love uh, browsing those books for ideas and new ways to look at a vegetable. And that's really what this does. It also talks about how he farms them and, and how important that is. And how, you know, you talked about this earlier with the craft beer movement. And we've seen this. You, you had it at the Grove in Grand Rapids with the farm to table. But local being so much more important now yeah. than it's ever been. And, and honestly, vegetables, plant-based diets being so much more important. Produce now. more than anything. It's seasonal. Totally. It, it is seasonal. And so, you know, we've seen the growth of vertical farms. We've seen cool ways to try to have great fresh vegetables here locally that you can trust. And I think that that is going to continue to move forward. All right, Fred, you got another one. Yeah, and I'll, I'll um, add in a little bit. So Beer Evangelist Guide, when it came to be, I wanted to talk, I wanted to write a book about uh, teaching people about beer flavors and how to pair beer flavors. But I kept getting stuck in this academic outline. And when it came alive is when I organized it seasonally and I added I, the philosophy of understanding how to eat seasonally which to me was brought to be my, by all my cook friends and chef friends in the world had totally turned my world around. And produce is an example of the modern day, and there's a story in the book about the modern day grocery store that we grew up with in our generation has distanced us from understanding seasons. Oh, we for sure. We don't even know, a lot of us, uh, we don't even know when, it, even corn, we, when's the season? I don't know, there's a rhyme somewhere. But like, because we have produce from all seasons represented 12 months and so that has uh created a weakness as cooks and so we can get that back by going to the farmer's market by paying attention by by locally uh, by cooking and eating locally we will bring back our seasonal instincts and that will show up on the plate it'll show up in our friend's smiles when they eat the food it's really remarkable no i totally agree um and and uh, actually and i'm not sure if you guys know this but in, in down in uh, kalamazoo there's something called the global food protection institute and one of their missions and their goals is to make sure that the the global food sources are also protected you do that when you have to when you shorten the length of time that food travels yep. and you know in a perfect world we have the beautiful michigan summers all year long where that we've shortened the amount of time the food travels to get to our store or our market or anybody else's market and then onto the plate. That should be all of our goals if possible, right. which is why, you know, you spend a lot of time sourcing locally, um, sourcing local food from local farmers. It's harder to do in the wintertime. Yeah. And, but at the same time, uh, we have the fortune of having some experience, you know, preserving, canning, uh, making pickles, things like that, where you can have like the vibrant kind of expressions of, you know, summer produce here. Um, and be able to enjoy it with like a, a turnip, let's say, or, or some butternut squash turnips. because that gets super boring after you eat it for the first month of fall. Um, but yeah, having really vibrant food that is, you know, not that long out of the ground uh, and not wrapped in cellophane and hasn't been on like a refrigerator truck. It's great to be able to be like, okay, I'm going to call a farmer I know and he's going to drop off some great produce today. Like yeah. that's a great relationship. It's an to have. amazing experience. All right, Fred, what's your next book? So cook, this cook, is, cook, this cook, is so. another local connection. Um, and this is by Eric Patterson and Jennifer Blakesley. Uh, they are the Cook's House in Traverse City, a small 25-seat restaurant. I've done a bunch of beer dinners with them. Uh, they are an inspiration. They, um, it, both in the book and in the way they run their restaurant and their lives, they just really reflect how, you know, uh, the pursuit of flavor, the pursuit of hospitality, uh, how it can, th that, um, Pursuit can be advanced and beautiful and technical and non-pretentious and warm and generous at the same time. And, and here they talk about ingredients, they talk about their approach. And this is definitely, uh, they are people in this book inspired me in terms of the tone of my own writing. And it helped me uh, shift into that storytelling mode and uh, aspire to something um, a more genuine, I think. You know what's really funny? People who don't, cook or who don't enjoy cooking might think you know we've all kind of lost our mind talking about being inspired by cookbooks but I'm one of those that are, that are all, a lot reading these reading ingredients and seeing what people put into them and learning about it and making mistakes. I mean, the best part of becoming a great chef or a great cook, a home cook, is you've made a few mistakes here or there. But I completely agree about the inspiration and, and what some of these can do. And if you have people on your guest on your on your shopping list who are culinary fans, then this is a great gift. Um, these are great gifts and great ideas for them to, to be inspired as well. Okay, Mike. Uh, my oh, wait, next wait, wait, wait. I guess, yeah. yeah, you go. Well, I got two oh, more, yeah, go so ahead. I'll go. Yeah, All right, ready? This one is so fun. Do you, either one of you have this one? 
Yeah, I do not. Mike, Mike, you do. All you right, recommended so recommended it to me. I think I did recommend it to you, didn't I? Let me let me zoom it in here. Okay, so this is Gorilla Tacos. Wes Avila from L.A. He was he grew up. His mother um, was cooking him, you know, tacos from the time he was a little boy. He got into a little trouble. Got figured it out, bought a $300 taco cart, and became a James Beard semifinalist. So he's an amazing, awesome. this book is unbelievable if you have taco lovers in your life. Let me zoom it in even a little more so you can see this, Gorilla Tacos. And then he took the cart and he created a restaurant, and he now has just left the restaurant, and he's opening up a new one in Chinatown. It's called, I wrote it down, I laughed. It's called uh, the Egret, right? Angry Egret. Yeah. Yeah, the Angry Egret. Nobody knows what it's going to be, but if, if you have taco fans and taco lovers, this is a great book. My favorite are the sweet potato tacos in here, and I'm a purist. I love carnitas. I love pork. I love all of that, but the sweet potato tacos with the Arbol sauce in this Beautiful. cookbook. Yeah, and it's a great cookbook, so check it out. Also, uh, kind of like yours, tells a really great story of his life, different life, but Excellent. a great yeah. story. So, All right, Mike, to you. So this... Um Happy in the Kitchen by Michel Richard. So he was a chef in Washington. Um, pastry chef uh, to start out his career, and then he moved into the savory side. So everything's like super fla or, uh, like playful. He's got something called tube technology that was like this kind of like tube. This IP that uh, uh, chefs would try to hire his team to come and like teach him how to do these things. So he would like, you know, take raspberry cookie dough and like put it into a plastic tube wrapped in plastic wrap. And then he'd have like a cooler full of these like plastic tubes and then you'd like take these really interesting shapes and colors and slice them on a slicer and make like paper thin like little crackers and things so like this beet chip um so just kind of a fun thing um one of my mentors uh who's actually working with us uh recommended this to me when i first started working for him like eight years ago so this is Hold a, it back a, up again yeah, Let's this take is a, a near and dear one he's also um there's a bill buford book that came out called dirt and so that's a recent one and he's um michelle richard is one of the first people that's featured in that book talking about his time working with him. So you mentioned your mentor who's working here. Uh, yeah. So that's Pat Wise. So he was the uh, uh, executive chef of Essence Restaurant Group. So Bistro Bella Vita, uh, Grove, Greenwell. Um, so he's got the winter time with me here. So it's been fun <laughs> to have my mentor teaching my uh, kids working <laughs> working together. So it's a fun uh, We lovingly call them the kids in the it's kitchen. It's the kids, but yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it's so much fun to be back there to see these guys. It is, there is a rhythm to it. You know, there's Absolutely. a chemistry to it. All cooking is, I always say, you know, baking is more, is more science and cooking is more art, but there's a chemistry that happens back in a kitchen when you've got a lot of stuff going on, and it's a really a fun like to be a part of. what you did there with the whole science world. Right? Thing. How about it's that? Really yeah. Listen, I'm not Psychology just Psychology and everything. Yeah. 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 You guys, it's I, I'm the chemistry that makes it happen. Yeah. I hope, listen, I hope you got your answer ready for your question, but let's go to your last cookbook, and then we'll be done here. So, what, oops, wrong one. Yeah, so uh, this is the way to cook, and like, you know, if anybody's done those social media 10 cookbooks, Julia had uh, three cookbooks in my top 10, so, sh so uh, th there's, some, there's nobody quite like Julia Child, and there are, I think there's two staples for her, there's The Mastery of Fine Cooking, I think if I got that title right, which is a great yep. book, um, but when I think, and I brought this because... Um, when I think about books for somebody who's looking to advance technique and, and saying, okay, I want to learn more, uh, this is that, this sort of replaced the better homes for me in terms of that instructional guide and really having somebody there to say, and this is why we whip the eggs this way. And, you know, she, she's just uh, very encouraging and, and yet very specific about uh, one of my favorite things is, you know, she talks about you, you need to learn to make the cream with the whisk before you use uh a tool like learn first then you can change and do some things with so learn the uh, right way learn tools. the learn the original yeah. way first so to yeah. me this has been a book that i've given to people in my life if they say i want to learn to cook it's a great, great so one. julia child to me always i always felt intimidated by her or or, or maybe the, her brand felt intimidating for someone to me like if you if you held up the the, the um one on the bottom the better homes and garden yeah. right that cookbook, that felt like, listen, I can do that, but I can't do Julia Child. But what you're saying is I looked at that the whole wrong way. Well, what I'm saying is if you look at the whole Julia Child brand and, and some of her books and her f and she has she's very rooted in French cuisine, uh, it certainly has some of that. And she's going to teach some things that are probably over your head. This, out of her library, this is the book that will bring you in uh, and um, get you started. And it is, it is more about being a cook. And I would say that both of these, the cooking at home also, but this is 
more instructional and more down to earth and less fine French cuisine, which I think requires a fundamental beginning before you start uh, and taking, a lot those of butter. taking those bites. And a lot of butter. A lot of butter. And All one thing I wanted to say, too, just in appreciation of this whole cookbook theme, is that, you know, I had said that uh, we were we'd recently uh, renovated our kitchen, and I had put the cookbooks away in boxes, and I hadn't brought them back in yet. And recent might be generous. Um, you say, I was in your house not that long ago. But uh, what I wanted to say is that there's something to be said about cookbooks, and I think my relationship with these books kind of predate browsing the Internet for ratios and recipes, and I also think advanced cooks, I don't really need a full recipe anymore. I might see something get an idea. But usually if I'm looking something up, it's a quick ratio or like what's, you know, I just need the bullet points and then I'm going to make it. But um, these books and this experience, the storytelling with you guys has reminded me the pleasure and the, uh, the way we're informed by cookbooks. And so browsing a cookbook and having food stains all over them yeah. to me yeah. is beyond what a YouTube video and uh, scrolling for recipes can give you so uh, it's a little bit of a plug for let's get in touch with our cookbooks if you don't have them perhaps uh, talk to Cheryl at the book nook and get some and leave the phone in the other room and cook for a while I, to I totally agree with that I mean I, I fall victim sometimes when I'm in a hurry I'm just gonna Google That's, something I do that all day I know but it <laughs> but it's frustrating because there are so many amazing and, and I literally read these I'll sit down on a Sunday night and read it's like a, cookbook. a memoir it totally yeah, is that's I mean why I like cookbooks exactly yeah. it's exactly right um, okay one final one for me and then I'm coming to the question about the beer one more beer question about you know what hasn't been invented yet that needs to but oh, let yeah. me just do this one real quick so this this one comes with a bit of an explanation, and Chef Mike's going to roll his eyes at me. Um, I am a sous vide fan, so I have both a, a Julie. A sous, do you sous vide? Yeah. Do you sous? Well, I know you sous vide. Yeah. I yeah. Do. yeah. Now a lot of people a lot of people are intimidated by that, but there are a couple different kinds of sous vide devices out there. So sous vide. Well, I'm going to let I'm going to let the chef talk about it, but it's basically water bath cooking, right? Yeah. So you can. I mean, people have been doing this for you know. A very long time without all the technology that we have so you put something in a bath of water or a pot of water and you hold it at a certain temperature and then you cook something in there so you're you know you want to cook a sausage it can't go above 170 degrees or the fat will separate from the meat so if you just add it to the pot under 170 degrees it can cook it very evenly and cleanly because water just transfers heat a lot better so now we've approached you know with technology where you can have a um, looks like a little outboard motor attached to a, a warmer or a little heating element, and it can uh, set the water to a very specific temperature to like a tenth of a degree. And, and so it and takes all fine the fun dining restaurant. It, it yeah. does take all the fun out of it, but but <laughs> but for for certain cuts of meat for me that yeah. I don't want to screw up, right? Yeah. It is a really cool way to do it. I'll make barbecue for you know forty people in a huge. Um, Rubbermaid, big old, you know, something you get at Target. Put it with water. Put the pork in a, you know, put a put a rub on the pork. Yeah. Put it in there. Sous vide it for 24 hours, and it comes out perfect. Right. So sous vide, if if you've ever heard of it, um, this is a cookbook. If you're ever going to think about getting somebody again, the the person who has everything who loves to cook, if they don't have a sous vide device, there are two out there on the market that I recommend. One is called a Julie, J O U L E. That one is really great for someone who's never done it before because the instructions and the user experience is so simple, you can't screw it up. And the other one is a, a little higher end one is an Innova Culinary Sous Vide. Um, I highly recommend um, both of them. And this cookbook, Sous Vide at Home, is another good one if you're going to do that. And a companion with the Julie is, um, so Chef Steps out of Seattle helped develop that. Yeah. And that website, if you are you know are interested in cooking, they go super deep into all of the science of it. Um, they have a bunch of free recipes, and they have a subscription service that I belong to. And it's just wild to see them kind of break down like um, some molecular fancy stuff and how to do it at home. So that's a really good companion. And I do love sous vide stuff. It's, it is, it's amazing. I mean, it's yeah. hard to screw it up. Right? Yeah, it and you really can just is. do wild things. You can cook eggs for an hour, and then they have different textures. Like there's, it's a great science experiment. It'd be good for a kid that wants to learn the science of cooking. Yeah, if you have a young, a young chef in your house, a young cook in your house, a sous vide, uh, a sous vide device, the for Julie, under two hundred dollars. Oh yeah, well, yeah. The, I think the Julie might even be closer 100, to a hundred yeah, or something like. Yeah. But it also has an app, and it's really hard to screw it up. And it, they will really learn the concept, you know. And then there's it is sort of the other side of our dog-eared cookbook discussion. Right. It is, right. it is. But I uh, wanted to show a changing little bit the temperature <laughs> of yeah. your eggs or yeah. your the barbecue companion. from your it's phone. It's a two-part thing. But what yeah. I would, I mean, I think you got to look at both things. Oh, it's right? cool. I don't want to be limited. My barbecue treatment is the opposite side of yours Smoke and it. i think both work well what i'm saying is you're saying you can do barbecue for 40 which is true and it's 
and it's going to be uniformly held because of circulation and everything, which is cool. But to me, where it shows up with barbecue is barbecue for two. When I don't feel like tending a smoker, yep. doing out all that, those hours, and I can vacuum seal, you know, one rack of ribs and uh, let it, uh, and it with rub, and then it cooks, and then I can fire up the grill and just put a little char on it. To me, it's sort of the shortcut for small amounts of people, because if, if I were doing 40, then I'm a little more emotionally invested in firing up the smoker and right. keeping that rolling for a while. And I don't want to do that on a Tuesday night. Well, you're right. And, and ribs is one of the things that I use the sous vide for a lot because I have a tendency to make them like shoe leather. So it <laughs> just helps me not do it's, that. It's so great for that. It is. It's All like right. an adult crock pot. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly what it is. All right. So, Fred? Well, I'm going to stall because I also haven't given you my third desert island beer. So, you want to <laughs> give me the third desert island first? Yeah, and I'm not going to give you... A beer. I'm gonna. I'll reference Waypost Saison because it's here. But I, my third beer, since I have two sort of, uh, you know, what do you, what do you call them? They're both over 10 percent beer. So if I'm on the island, <laughs> you're smashed. Well, you, don't you know, care. and I want to chill island, out for an matter. afternoon. Saison as a style, and I think there's many different styles. Saison Dupont from Belgium is kind of the original love for me, but I think Saison is just a romantic. Uh, easy going beer that has lots of different expressions and to me that's my third dozen out desert island style all right and i might make it on the island all right ready yeah what ha what beer hasn't been invented yet that needs to be invented this is our final question do you have a do you have an I input have no idea <laughs> i think the uh regenerating refilling beer that as, <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, as that's you drink it replenishes itself in the glass yeah. a little matrix like right yeah. I, mean, that's, like I mean if we're bringing out the magic wand we, it's okay. your magic wand you can do uh, whatever you wish want. a little so and it never I, goes I would away. probably regret it after it was made because i'd be like why didn't i go to bed last night right so right all right well you guys this was fun uh it was it's always fun to have you here and um we've got the rising tide really quickly give a push for this that up down there so we can see that yeah so the rising tide this is a more recent book uh came out in um uh 2019 and so as a longtime member and collaborator with michigan brewers guild we wanted to tell the history of the michigan brewing scene uh wanted to do that through um through a series of interviews so another sidebar project i have is this craft nation which is at thiscraftnation.com, and it started as a book project, which hasn't really come out, but we have, we air a lot of interviews. I traveled the country uh, doing interviews with independent makers to get a sense of the marketplace and the shift that we're going through. So then that experience, along with some other stuff, really uh, gave me the tools and wherewithal to look at this Brewers Guild project in terms of a series of interviews. So we'd have multiple stories, multiple perspectives on how did this come to be? And what's important about collaboration? What's important about why the Michigan brewing scene is the way it is because people in 1997 decided to come together instead of shoot bows and arrows at each other. And so this tells that story through a series of 35 interviews. And now that continues. We've been, we started this year during the pandemic interviewing again, and we're alternating. We're, we, uh, if you can go to mibeer.com and you can see videos both of the interviews that are in this book and also Zoom calls with interviews in the here and now. Uh, but this has those quotes from those interviews interwoven with the narrative of uh, the first brewers of Michigan, their home brewing roots, the stories, how we came together as a community, and what we're looking forward to from now. So it's also a quick read, embraces storytelling. Volume one, it doesn't include everybody uh, because it couldn't, but I think I'm really grateful for the people that make up the community of Michigan beer, and uh, this is a little bit of a love letter. All right. Well, thank you so much. And before I forget, and we're gonna we're gonna go out with the Michigan beer fight song, All which right. I now is my new favorite song. I used to sing the Michigan fight song. Now I'm gonna sing the Michigan beer fight song. I also want to remind everybody today is Small Business Saturday, and I know there's a lot of small businesses in Saugatuck and Douglas. If you're here locally, that would would love to see you today. It's been a rough uh, it's been a rough year. <laughs> For everybody in a, in a multitude of ways, not just businesses, but everybody at home too. But um, we are doing a, a promotion with our friends at Landshark. We love Dave and Casey Locker. So uh, for a hundred dollar, any hundred, any denomination of a hundred dollars of combination, if you get four twenty fives, you'll get a, a free twenty dollar gift card to Landshark. So this was their idea. I want to give them props. They came to us. They're doing it with the Southerner, I believe. They're doing it with Wally's. 
Uh, if you go to Land Sharks and buy a $100 gift card there, then you'll get a $20 gift card from a place of your choice, including Isabel. So we wanted to do that. We've also got bis gift baskets here if you're looking for some cool culinary ideas for people. But it's Small Business Saturday. It's not all about us. It's about everybody in this town who have worked so hard to get through this. And, and I will say, and I've said this before, we've worked really hard together, and I'm really proud of that for, for everybody. Um, and uh, we hope it continues through the whole holiday season and beyond. So, guys, uh, Chef Mike Braccio. It's wonderful to see you not in cranberries like yes, I saw you last like week. Last, this week. This week, yeah. yeah. So I guess it is this week. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for and having me. And bringing your cookbooks. And Fred, as always, my friend, you're, you're awesome. We are appreciative. And uh, we're going to go out with your, with your... Now, you wrote this song, right? I did. You wrote because... You it started as the American Beer Fight Song. There was American Beer Week or American Beer Month rally that we were going to in the late 90s. And on the Pennsylvania Turnpike coming home from that rally in Philadelphia, I wrote it on the back of an envelope. <laughs> and <laughs> then, uh, I, then as the Michigan Beer Month started to happen around our beer festivals and around our community and we got proclamations, I realized we need a fight song. And American and Michigan have the same number of syllables. So let's drink American beer became let's drink Michigan beer. I love it. Uh, All right, everybody, drink Michigan beer. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next Facebook Live. We'll be sure to let you know when that is. And, and here it is, Fred's, uh, Fred's beautiful, wonderful song and, <laughs> and love letter to Michigan beer. Thank you. Bye, guys. Let's drink Michigan beer. Let's